Okay, well, greetings from Australia and uh, thank you for having me, Matt. And, uh, it's wonderful. Yeah, I hope to be. So, wonderful to have you. We're so pleased. Yeah, my name's Ken. As you know, Ken McLean, I uh, reside in Sydney, Australia, and uh, been practicing macrobiotics about 47 years. And uh, I'm currently running a centre where I have for over 40 years. Uh, which uh, we uh, study and practice and teach uh, macrobiotic understanding as well as shiatsu, aikido, and key energy related activities. A um, little bit of background. I first got into it. Well, when I was fifteen, we dropped a few friends and myself. We dropped out of school and went and lived in a forest for a few years yes. up the coast of Australia, which is like a you know, forests and, and it was a coastal area because we love surfing. So we got into surfing and vegetarianism and natural living. We built a shack in the forest. And uh, during our time there, we would go for, for, foraging in the local uh, rubbish tips, you know, where people discard the stuff they don't want. And uh, on one of those occasions, we found a, a battered old book called uh, Ural Sampaku. Some of you may have read that. Has anyone read that? An early Georgia Sale book. It's pretty full on, actually. And, uh, yeah, so things weren't working for us in normal school and work-related stuff, so we dropped out for a while and uh, discovered macrobiotics. And as soon as we got into that, uh, it's like uh, a wild ride began. Yeah. And uh, so we moved back to the city and started studying more formally the East West Foundation, which was a Mishio Kushi related centre was just starting to establish in Sydney. And then one thing led to another and 47 years uh, have gone by and I've had 10 children, have 11 grandchildren, basically brought up that way, macrobiotic way. And uh, what fascinates me about macrobiotic, well, among the myriad things that fascinate me is that how that there's a movement that starts to uh, gain momentum when we start to balance and come to the centre, you know, through biologically through food and our blood and organs, etc., and how things start moving. <clears throat> it happened with me in my own case, but also uh, it's been amazing and magical to see it happen in so many people that uh, adopt this way of life. And uh, so we have a word in Australia. It might be. A, a bigger word than Australia, it's called, the Indigenous people use that word, song line, that sort of line that travels through our life and, and all the people we've met and experiences and the stories and, that unfold. Uh, I guess sometimes it's called line of destiny or, uh, or realising our dream. And, uh, and what it's so uh, interesting when we start to create that balance, how it starts to unfold effortlessly and naturally and easily. So the ease that's created in that expression of our deepest self. And uh, I like the saying, uh, health is a realization of all our goals without force or struggle. And uh, when we're in that process, it just seems to come so easily and the right things occur at the right time as you would have all experienced. Sometimes when we drift off that line, though, things get a little bit more sluggish or like a boat, you know, boats have this sort of, sort of triangular front to cut through and create an unfolding path. They don't have a square front because of the resistance that's created. Similarly, with uh, as you would know, with our diet, you know, the more wide we eat, the more resistance is created. But once we've experienced that centre, be, it becomes a reference point to always return to. And to as we do that, we see it start to open and unfold again. I guess in macrobiotics, we talk about um, eating, the three levels of eating, eating to realise our deepest level of health. Second one is eating to maintain that. Perhaps the first one's more, a little bit more coming in with the food and, and getting the balance and realising our deep, and as our health increases and as it comes out in bigger and bigger ways, it becomes easier to maintain that. It becomes more flexible. Like when we drive down the road, we don't hold on to the steering wheel. We move it from side to side. 
And then the third way of eating, as you would know, is uh, called eating to, uh, eating to realize your dream, which is a bit like that destiny thing. I'm also, uh, I've also been fascinated by Aikido because when I first got into macrobiotics, I kept in reading George Sauer's work, he kept mentioning when he was relating to the seventh level of judgment or consciousness, he, he would use the word I. So it, got, it sort of uh, tweaked my interest. And he mentioned the founder of Aikido, Morahei Ueshiba, was the uh, bodily realization of the unifying principle. So, um, so there's this interesting connection there for me. In, in Aiki, the first, there's, there's no opponent, there's no other person, there's just the oneness of things and that everything is gift, which to me is part of the, you know, the seventh level of health in macrobiotics we call uh, the seventh level of health, endless appreciation, where we, we're in that state where we see even the most, most difficult thing or the most challenging attack as a, a gift to help us grow and become more connected to everything. So in so relating to that, realising our dream in Aikido, there's that word, um, first victory is victory through bringing out our deepest self. And the second victory is called victory through realising our the destiny that only you can realise, no one else, our unique destiny. So, um, yeah, that's been, it's, so what I'd like to talk about and try and illustrate some of the holistic principles within macrobiotics through some of the people I've interacted with and have seen amazing shifts in their health. The first person I'd like to talk about is a guy called Steve. He's another, he's another old surfer that lives in the area that I live. Uh, I, live I live on the coast, Bronte. It's a beautiful place and I like to surf regularly. But I knew him from the area, but then I ran into him one day and he said he had uh, stage four liver cancer. My partner, Ran, suggested uh, to him to come and have a dietary consultation. So he'd had his liver section a few times. If anyone doesn't know what that means, it means when they cut out a piece of it because the liver regenerates and it grows. But they'd reached the point where uh, they'd cut out too much and they couldn't do it. So he's on his last time and instead of it comes back, that's it. So it was coming back continuously. Um, he also uh, had previously had bowel cancer. He comes from a quite well-known family of hang gliders. His father kind of founded hang gliders. I still treat him with shiatsu. His father's now 89. He's fallen out of the sky five times. He's been very fortunate to survive. His body's, you know, all bent, and, but uh, he certainly lived a big life. <clears throat> anyway, his son, who was in his 60s at this time, is, uh, yeah, as I said, he had stage four liver cancer. One of the first things that was, that was interesting to watch was um, he had a bit of a hot, due to his bowel cancer stuff that he, before he discovered macrobiotics, he'd had a bit of a hole created in his lower abdomen from various operations. And so he could see a little bit of the tissue of his intestine through there. At that time, before he changed the diet, he, it was black, it was a dark color. After he was amazed, he was blown away, but after one week or one to two weeks, he looked and it was, had gone pink, it had, you know, it had transformed. So it, it was amazing for, for him to experience this organ change and, and, and within about three to four months, the liver cancer had completely uh, gone into remission and uh, it set him off on a, on a a search for what he loved to do. One of the things that um, he uh, had done in those 30 years he'd worked for his father, he worked in the family business. He'd played the dutiful son. He'd, he'd run the business for his father, but he'd realised he'd suppressed so much because he wasn't doing what he really loved. And what's interesting for me is the process of healing that takes place. Firstly, I think the most important thing is the organs and the blood. Blood is a divine substance that nourishes the cells. And as you know, the, the blood changes every 120 days and all the cells of the blood completely transform in 120 days. So you can have amazing shifts. By that time, I, I think the emotional level starts to really kick in the higher emotional expression. We have lower uh, emotional expression of organs, such as, uh, you know, when we talk about anger in the liver or excitement in the heart and uh, so on. 
Um, initially, he, he focused on diet. But then eventually, as his health improved, he started to notice he had all this stored emotion. So I believe there's a timing where stored emotion starts to release and move out of the body to be replaced by higher emotions. Um, sometimes it's, I believe it's not necessary to focus on the emotions initially because of the uh, once the organs start changing. The organs are amazing, as you know, they bring out, they have wonderful vibrational expression we call it emotion, emotion, energy moving outward. And uh, so what, what was important for him was to quit his job, not be dutiful son. And he realised this and he started to uh, heal emotionally. And uh, gradually that led him to moving to Western Australia with his wife and moving to the desert. And uh, now he lives in the desert on this wild Western Australian coast, cooks his rice and vegetables and does all manners, all manner of surfing expression. Uh, uh, there's a bit of a surfing theme here. This is the last story about surfing that I mentioned, but um, he's now about 69 and he's surfing these incredibly big waves. I don't know how he does it. But to see that he was on death's door and now he's living his a bigger life, the life that he loves with his wife supporting him and... Uh, it was interesting he had to move so far away, but I think uh, with him, what I've noticed in, in my own life when earlier on, that uh, there's this word in Japan, called, Japanese word called makoto. You may have heard that word, makoto. And uh, makoto means our, our most sincere expression of who we are, our most natural or authentic self. Uh, children often are just expressing that before conditioning sets in. And... Uh, that return to that, uh, that sunao is another Japanese word, that mild, defenceless, open state, gentle. So in his case, often we find that, uh, yeah, so makoto means that, but it also has another meaning, the kotodama meaning. Kotodama meaning of makoto, ma means space. Koto means word. It's the space to hear our own word, free of uh, adulteration. So uh, often meditation creates that, of creating a space where we can hear our own word without the clutters of, of, our, of other people's thoughts or opinions or social stuff. In his case, he had a strong role in a very large family, in turn, like his sisters and his brothers and his parents, and, and uh, they had a certain view of him. And it feels like he's had to create this huge space, go so many thousand miles away as part of his restoring of who he is in his own happiness without any uh, expectation. So uh, Steve, due to the fact that he had this remarkable healing, it created a bit of a ripple in his, the community around here. So often other people are coming up to him with serious cancer and uh, he sends them to me and one of them is Phil. <clears throat> one of them was, uh, he had bone cancer and he said initially that he only come because he's trying to please Steve. And then he only adopted the diet to please me. He had this very, I don't know, accommodating personality. He didn't believe in it. And uh, he was very different to Steve, much more yang person. Well, bone cancer is yang. And often we think that uh, cause of bone cancer is from yang food. And I think that's a factor, you know, when we eat, have yang and then often it affects a yang system. But, but we know the opposite is true that, Yin attracts yang. And in his case, uh, first thing I saw when I looked at him was marijuana. And uh, we know that drugs are extreme yin. Marijuana is not as yin as some drugs, but that, the old saying is a thousand times more yin than sugar, attracted to the bone level. However, he was very focused and had very strong will. And uh, he showed me a few things. The things he showed me was usually within cancer healing, we say we need a you know, five or six things to be there. And one of them is uh, supportive support. And sometimes it's suggested if partner's not supportive or not adopting way of eating, then uh, should move out for a while now. However, and the other thing was, I often say to people, this works even if you don't believe it. So although he didn't believe it, I think positive thinking is very important, but in his case, he didn't believe, he just adopted and he did it. 
And as he did it, he started to heal and he started to change. His, his uh, wife was very the opposite of supportive, not only not supportive, but very critical, attacking. And uh, even though he was in that environment, he, showed, he had strong will and he managed to succeed in uh, completely transforming himself. And he's not together with his wife anymore, but he's completely um, better. Um, third, third, within that stream of cancer, I'll change, uh, change theme soon, but uh, there was one person who didn't get better who passed on. And sometimes, uh, so I believe macrobiotics is also, as, as perhaps you do, is, a, is not only working on our physical body, but our energetic body. And some, and we talk about that, you know, when we're in the, when we're in the womb, when the baby's in the mother's womb, the placenta is the form of nourishment that gives rise to this baby. And the yin part rises, goes on, and the placenta we bury. You know, yang goes back to the earth. And now we are, now this body, as you know, is placenta for next body, energetic body, meridian body. Sometimes we talk about gen yu rei shin, Japanese words. Gen means physical. Yu means, yu, yu, yu tai means astral or meridian body and so on, spirit, divine spirit, the layers of self. Um, yeah, this guy, I call him John, he, uh, he'd heard about it. He was in his 60s also. <coughs> Excuse me. He, um, he came to me. He'd had very serious bowel cancer and they'd medical profession and doctors had operated on him and taken a lot of his bowel. But they weren't, mustn't have been high quality because they'd almost butchered his bowel. And uh, by the time he got to me, he was, uh, he was very weak and depleted and however uh, he wanted to we looked at positively changing his, his health and and overcoming this challenge that he had and uh, so he adopted that way of eating but interesting when i when i also give him i was giving him this form of shiatsu called ki shiatsu interesting thing there was um when i touched him I couldn't feel his meridians. There's this quality in, in touch and shiatsu, if you've done it for a while, that there's this living quality. And the more, the better someone's eating and the more they have a kind of a engagement in healthy life, you can feel the qualities and the points, the meridians easily. However, with him, I couldn't feel them. So sometimes there's this process of body leaving and we talk about the five spirits in the five elements and the, you know, uh, relating to the organs and relating to the, you know, the understanding of the five transformations. You know, we talk about the first spirit relate in the kidneys called will, and then uh, wood or tree energies called soul or also a higher emotional body, and then divine spirit relating to fire element, and then spirit, uh, mind is the called soil element, mind, reasoning, intellect, and then, of course, uh, metal element we say is... Uh, breath breath and usually if someone was very healthy we talk about natural death as uh, that being just one complete process if we're in our unified health and being just one but that's rare these days isn't it just to take everything away at once usually there's a drawn out process usually um <clears throat> you know it's interesting to see that on some level when someone has uh, developed some internal blockage or a strong, when they're getting, you know, strong one like cancer, that there may have been uh, something in their life that where their will withdrew, even if it's not consciously acknowledged, their desire to fully pa participate with their whole being in life, there can be some event or, or whatever reason where there's a withdrawal. And then there's this process over time of leaving. Obviously it happens, it's natural, you know, when we, pass on, there's a natural process of believing. And uh, as I said, you can do it as one or it can be slightly drawn out or really drawn out. Because we know in certain cases when people, when we get older, that sometimes our mental faculty, the force spirit, you know, just before breath leaves can be less clear, particularly, in, you know, things like Alzheimer's and other conditions, nervous system conditions. So anyway, John, we'll call him, he came and... Uh, he was very hopeful to heal. 
but there's interesting quality when someone's meridian body is leaving. But still, we want to bring it back, even if it's leaving. We want to try encourage people to participate. But as he went on, the news he was getting from the doctors was it's continuing to grow and spread. His life force in his body wasn't strong enough to uh, to overcome that. And uh, I prepared his uh, family, talked to them. And I didn't talk to him so much, but what was happening due to, due to this feeling of, uh, you know, this. But he kept coming for shiatsu and coming for macrobiotic support. And he said to me, uh, Ken, um, if, I, if the news continues to get bad, I'm going to throw this diet away and I'm going to get back into my hamburgers and my milkshakes and this and that. I'm going to just. So, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. And, uh, but um, let's see. Anyway, he did get bad news. He, it, the tumour had spread. And I said, well, uh, John, are you going to, uh, now that you're, you've had that news, are you, uh, you want to throw away the diet? Stop seeing me now, he said. The other thing I'd say about him was that he, uh, when I treated him, when we talked, he'd had a lot of anger due to how his father treated him. And he'd had a lot of resentment. And he was a very quiet man. So his family didn't really know him, his children. He was very, very quiet and contracted. But... Uh, but he started to change and he started to become more open and start talking. And this is this thing that happens, isn't it? This, as it spreads, as the organ energy changes and the cellular energy, and as we receive that nourishment, stuff to spread out. He, uh, he said, you know what? I'm feeling so peaceful. I know I'm leaving. I know I'm, I'm going to die. But I don't feel the anger and I, I'm getting on with my children and, with, and uh, I think I should stay with this even though I'm, I know I'm dying soon. And so his dying became this great opportunity that he utilised to start to really connect to his family and have deep conversations and uh, they go out on boats and celebrate and talk and, you know, and he, he really entered that process positively, peacefully and uh, really utilised that well. So, you know, sometimes healing is uh, not always healing of the body, but is this, you know, this whole family spiritual process. Um, okay, moving on. I should move on to another one. If anyone has Let me ask any... you a question, yeah. Yeah. Your stories are amazing. I mean, they're so touching. I'm wondering about, did you give each one of these specific macrobiotic dietary advice uh, or just general uh, standard diet, or how specific did you get? Pretty specific. I mean, first thing is, um, you know, as you know, uh, the, the general macrobiotic centering diet, balancing diet. And then within that might look at uh, specific dishes for, for that organ. And uh, I think you've got to have a foundation of the basics that cover everything, you know, a diet that's going to work on the whole body. And then there's specific dishes targeted for different organs. Probably won't go too much into that now, but I'm sure mm -hmm. a lot of knowledge in that area. So, um, and, and yeah, then and would you do some reps, external, external remedies? remedies yeah. Like liver drinks and, you know, mm -hmm. internal remedies if necessary. Um, and then would you also give spiritual counseling? Yeah, I tend to. I yeah, I tend to do that. I mean, I, I do t tend to see these people regularly, at, you know, depending on their the rhythm. Each person's got their own rhythm, such as I think spiritual counselling. Sometimes when I'm doing shiatsu, it's a key shiatsu, uh, that's a way of also talking about. I find that when you touch different parts of the body, different issues come up. In It's like a counselling. <coughs> and we'll explore deeply... Uh, you know, whatever that issue comes, when, when it naturally arises at the time, it becomes holistic. And uh, as I said earlier, I think the diet is the foundation. It's the ground floor. It's very important to have strong foundation. But, of course, when we build a building, we don't live in the foundation, do we? We need to put the building on top and then, you know, so on. So I think we, you know. And also, I, I also say to the, I think, I think part of healing is 
discovering our own internal power as human beings. And I say to people that if sometimes they come and say, a doctor said, I've, this is, I've only got this long. And I said, well, they can't tell you. You tell, you say how long. You are the director of your movie, right? You are in charge, you know. It's, no one can tell you. You're choosing. And uh, I'll tell, I, I'd like to talk about Kerry. Kerry was a, this is a bit longer ago. She was uh, in her 40s and uh, she came initially with a sore shoulder. Wouldn't get better. Right shoulder. That'll make sense. And uh, she, she came from macrobiotic diet and I started also treating her. And uh, as that kicked in, I, I gave a diet for lung. It seemed to be the lung related, you know, the shoulder, you know, the, we talk about the associate, well, you can't see my hand, the associate areas, lung, heart. So often there's injuries, like elbow injuries. We look at middle organs and knees, we look at middle organs. <clears throat> and if we change the organ, the energy, the pain in the joint goes, so, or if someone's had an injury. In her case, it was shoulder, lung. So we looked at diet for lungs. <clears throat> and as I started treating her, I noticed there was a bit of green, you know, we talk about cancerous quality of the green colour down the meridian or down that line, the lung lines, the thumb side of the inside of the arm. But I would say it was a pre-cancerous thing and I don't think it was uh, helpful to bring up the word cancer because sometimes that word, you know, someone hasn't been medically diagnosed. And uh, But I started steering the diet and the treatments that way and then gradually, uh, you know, there's some improvement, but gradually the, she, she was very... Uh, Visual diagnostically, she was quite pale, which is a lung colour, quite white. And she had a, she's a very positive person, spiritual person. She was a movie director at the time. She, uh, she did have a melancholic quality about her. But, and uh, as that process of support went, you know, in, in counselling and so on, I started also noticing a quality around the left side, orically, if you're into that. I don't know if everyone's into that, but. Orically, there's a quality there. And we know that father's ancestral stream comes from the left and mother's and, and manifests off on the other side. I don't always look at it from this point of view. I think you've got to be really open and, and allow the process to unfold and see that everyone has a unique uh, way of approaching things. In her case, I, there was this obvious... So there was a time... Often natural timings arise where our intuition will bring up something. If I had brought this up earlier in the process, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have connected, I, I don't believe, but there was a timing where her body, mind, spirit, was emotion was right. So I said, how do you feel about your father? At that moment, she burst into tears. Probably wouldn't happen before. It was just a timing thing. And she said, I haven't been able to uh, let go of him. Really, he died seven years ago. I'm still grieving. She wouldn't have, you know, she was ready to acknowledge that in herself and feel it and share it. And, uh, okay, and she said, you know, so she cried and she felt sad, but then we, we looked at this idea of the next world, you know. Um, it's a, we looked at what a centred, a centred way of responding in an uncentred. Uncentred way is uh, if someone's in the room with you and you're crying and not, and deny, you know, where, you know, crying, where are you gone? And yet they're there tapping you on the shoulder. It's a little, we say that's uncentered motion, right? Better to acknowledge them, speak to them. We say prayer and spiritual healing is just speaking, you know, with a certain spirit. And uh, so for, in that treatment or that approach, we started looking at a, a centered way of, for her to uh, speak to him. Or, and so we actually made a little bit, sometimes people need a little bit of ritual and form. And so um, I mentioned maybe make a shelf at home with a picture of him and, and when you're really centred and off your emotion and can get from your deeper place to speak and acknowledge and, you know, communicate. So I didn't see her for a while, but then she came back and was very happy after a while and her arm was free and she said, by the way, can I sell the car, his car I had for seven years? And was, what, what was very an interesting sideline to, side to that is that uh, her career completely shifted then. She, she became a, uh, 
famous psychic in Italy. She was in Australia. She'd go there for six months. She became a psychic person and started reading things for people. Before that, she was, you know, in uh, theatre and directing shows. And, uh, yeah, okay. So I'll carry on with that. another one. No, nothing to bring up? Feel free. Okay. What I'm trying to probably, what my aim is more, not so much, is more how there's these interconnected relationships to food and spirit and emotion. And I'm not really going into detail of diet and stuff like that, but uh, I think most people on here would be familiar with that stuff, I think. Uh, what's this guy's name? Uh, this other guy. So another man I saw once, or for quite a while, was... Uh, he uh, had rheumatoid arthritis. He uh, was giving a talk at what the, this thing called the Sydney Festival, and this, yeah, I saw him approaching me, and he looked like he had cerebral palsy because he was so locked, his hands were bent over, and he was hopping, and he was coming over, and I thought he had that. But he said one day he was in the pub with his friends, you know, pub is uh, drinking beer, and he said, I suddenly got attacked, and I was completely restricted in great pain. It just came on me <clears throat> and uh he was quite a yang guy was like small build kind of fire type you know small proud but very humorous fire type in terms of constitutional type we've got condition we know we've got condition condition is not always constitution so, so a metal type might have a different condition to their constitution but he was a fire type he also had a yang job by the way, we, we say the Australian, in Australia, we say Yang because we've got Australian accent. I believe in Yang, Yo, Yo, and Yeah. Yeah, so but there's many ways to say Yin and Yang, but I say, we say Yin and Yang in Australian. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so he was a rigger, which is these guys that put in those metal scaffolding on buildings. He'd be up on the buildings, riding, directing, very directing sort of guy, Yang. And uh, what else he was yang? He did take one do, punch kick, you know, into yang activity. And then he uh, was the life of the party at the pubs, you know, he felt caught, they were on large, he was great humorous, as fire types often are very good. At and uh, what else can I say, the yang? So he, he, oh yeah, he loved steak. So obviously beer and steak balance. You can see that in the physiognomy, you know, and, uh, yeah, so then he's attacked by a very, so from that yang approach to life, in the, you know, of, of, there was, he attracted a, a yang environment. His body became incredibly contracted, restricted, so he couldn't move. He was in a wheelchair initially, initially. They wanted to inject, at that time they were doing, I, I'm not sure about this, but they were injecting gold into severe cases, some gold thing, and they get a, a temporary relief, but in the end it, it doesn't do the body that much good. So he um, he discovered a raw food diet and uh, he got some relief with that because obviously in the seesaw of, you know, the Yang diet, he went up the other end and, you know, for a while. So instead of being really restricted to there, he, got, he went like that. He was still very restricted, but just a little bit of ease. So we discussed this idea of macrobiotic diet. Of course, he had this very Yang logical, strong will. He was very uh, black and white. So when he came for macrobiotic consultation, he, he, and we, well, it was at that time, it was quite, I, I, it was quite a few years ago. So it was a bit more narrow. And, you know, we evolve, don't we, with our practice, we get more flexible more and we see as macrobiotics does, you know, universe is evolving, life's evolving, our understanding evolves. <clears throat> he, uh, so he practiced to the letter, which was a good thing. He, he didn't think about anything else but food. He didn't want any shouts. He didn't want anything. He didn't want to be touched. Just practiced. After a while, he, you could see him freeing up a little. He started to free up. He's starting to shift that, you know, his body's getting better. But still, there's some things. His exercise, he, he used to live near the beach too. And he'd, he'd, he'd start at one end of the beach and he'd look at the other end. And he would, even though it was very painful, he would push and force himself to walk to that goal, that goal at all costs. 
And I said, so that was interesting. He had that very yang, still yang. So I suggested to him, uh, when you're doing that walk, let's say his name was uh, Bill. Bill. When you're doing that walk, it's great. I said, occasionally just try this. And he'd write things down, right? Occasionally turn your head and look at the wave and the beauty of the wave. Right, so uh, right, look at wave, look at the beauty of the wave. Okay. Next, what else can you tell me? Well, when you hear the seagulls, just well, okay, it's just occasionally stop and listen to all the sounds, you know. Okay, listen to sounds, seagulls. Anyway, so and so on. So smell, smell sea air. Smell sea air, okay. So now he adopted that rigidly, precisely. So gradually that he was ready to start to relax and release and open. So naturally it's starting to spread out to, to how he exercised. But obviously he needed initially to become more conscious. And so the principle of relaxation and openness within exercise. And uh, so he started doing that. He's getting better. He's getting freer all the time. He's starting to really loosen up and uh, get better. And then he said, uh, one thing I noticed, Ken, is when I walk across the pedestrian crossing at the set of lights where the cars are waiting. I'm a little bit later to come around than everyone else because I'm slower and I'm just not getting quite across and a car will come around and bit their horn and, and I'll just look at them and I'll stick my fingers up and swear at them and yell and every time I do that, I get these attack of shooting pains. And I said, yeah, well, you know, the... Angering up the liver, you know, we talk about how it uh, anger, angers the blood, you know, and so the blood attacks, you know, acidifies the blood. So we started looking at uh, how to calm his energy, how to respond more gently, how to, uh, you know, so, you know, we talk about an Aikido centering, the centre of our, and we talk about the centre as a prior place of fulfilment. When we're calm and in touch with our inner self at our centre, it's a prior place of fulfillment. Prior place means nothing can fulfill us outside ourselves. We can interact very, we can enjoy everything else, but nothing will, we have to find out happiness inside. I'm going off track now into sort of a principle that I like at the prior place. When we give our power over there, I'll be happy there, or, or that'll make me happy. We're leaning out of our sphere of influence, and we often take a, you know, a disappointing fall. So anyways, and the word responsibility in centering understanding is the ability to choose the most appropriate response. What is that ability is to really stay calm and let emotional responses wash over us and wait for the deeper whole being response to come out. Anyway, basically we're talking about for him calming. So a little bit longer past, he's doing all this stuff. He's completely freed up. He said, I'm out dancing. I've got a new girlfriend. I'm going out dancing every night. I'm feeling great. Except one thing. I've got a little pain in my fingertips. I said, uh, you know, uh, I forgot to mention to you guys, uh, when he got that attack and he was put in a wheelchair, he had four children. His wife left him with the kids. Talk about challenges. She walked out on him. And uh, so he had to go through that, which... You know, life only gives us what we can handle, right? So he, uh, it helped his energy come out more. But uh, so he said, I've got this little pain in my joints. I'm out dancing. I'm okay. It's very nothing. I said, well, I said, well, have you forgiven your wife? And he said, no. I said, well, do that and that'll go. He said, you know what, Ken? He said, I can live with that. I can live with this pain. He didn't, he didn't want to. He may have done that later. He may have taken that step. I don't think I should go into any more, but uh, I'd like to open it up if anyone has questions or want to discuss anything about this, tonight's topic. What do you think, Gunnar? How did you make the association with the joint pain and the forgiveness? It wasn't intellectual. It was uh, yeah. just understanding his process and, uh, and knowing that he... Uh, that was what he needed to do. Yeah, I, I didn't do it with a technical. Hmm. Yeah, yeah which was, is uh, you know part of macrobiotic diagnosis. We talk about key diagnosis. 
And we talk about, you know, there's different, there's visual diagnosis. We call that Boshin, you know, visual, looking face, lips, everything. There's uh, diagnosis through touch, you know, points, and looking at meridians, and it's that confirming, you know, if the lung there, press that point, conf confirmation, there's uh, through listening. Uh, listening means there's many levels of listening. There's listening through what the person's saying and the, the emotion they get, I feel, you know, the emotion they're giving to that. There's listening where, where does the sound come from and the quality of sound, you know, the five sounds of the five transformation. Slightly whiny is kidney, you know, slightly, you know, so there's that. And then there's another level of listening where, so it's part of, I've written a book about what we call the four relationships and the, centered listening and the energy principles. So in macrobiotic understanding, although it's not talked about a lot, is Mishio Kushi would talk about is diagnosed through, through uh, connection and image. We get an image because of our connection. And so there's another level of listening where we listen very deeply from a, 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 our center and uh, we get insight and image through that. So I think all these things combine. And so often there may be an obvious indi indicator through looking. And then there's, then there's more subtle levels that we can get in touch with. Yeah, any, anything else? I have a question. Yeah. Aaron, uh, so yeah. nice to meet you. Oh. Uh, these are wonderful stories, amazing. Uh, but comes to mind, there's some people who didn't make it. Not every single right. one. People who did not succeed. Yes. With, can you tell about your experiences? Why it, sometimes it works and some, but sometimes it doesn't work? Yeah, well, I think, you know, there's that saying, there's no incurable disease, but there are incurable people. And there's... So I don't think any, I think we can take on every challenge, and do our best, but uh, there are no guarantees. And there's something I call X factors too, you know, um, unknown qualities. And ultimately people are, are in charge of their own destiny and we have to respect that and support that. And, and everyone has different lifespans. So although we have this ideal, you know, idea of time, you know. I was going to say, you know, sometimes we talk about that line of destiny, you know, um, and I describe it as a line going up, like a line, like stretch. And that's how, like, if we live to a life to our full potential, we'd live a long life, 120 years, or maybe that's a bit long these days, Nine, whatever it is. And then, but also then we've got our piece of string, which is our, the actions we choose, and we can sometimes use up our constitutional reserves. We can replenish them. I always hope if someone's completely, uh, how do you say, depleted, we still try and replenish. There's always, however, there's this other line, like a piece of string, that we want to match to that. And we in it, and this bit of string, we might it goes around this line. And if our if our movement is too much detouring, like enjoying the, the wide yin-yang movement, then it sort of can't quite stretch to meet. But if we make choices and learn from them, we've got, we start to bring this line closer and closer so that it can reach the end. So there's these choices we make to align with that. And, and so there's no, I don't think there's a, an answer to that question. I think there's, there is an answer for for a particular person. Everyone is unique. So why someone isn't achieving that, we'd have to talk about, we'd have to be with them and, you know. But there are things where choices are made where constitutional reserves are depleted and, uh, and also their own internal choices and decisions about this life and what they want to do. And death is never bad, is it, anyway, really. It's a natural process. Next world is a wonderful place. Yeah. 
It's wonderful. So easy come, easy go. Although we'll try our best to live long. How do you know about the next world? This asking me that. I Clara here. Here. How do I know? Um, you say it's wonderful. How do you know? Look, I don't want to claim. Uh, well, I know. Well, I think we all know because we've all we've all come from there and going back, right? There's a cyclic thing. The debt, you know. So I think there's this tangible experience we can have with our energetic dimension. And uh, I've just had many experiences in my life with that world, and it's a it's one that I have a particular enjoyment and interest about and having been around you know so uh i'm thinking of a story I'm thinking i've got lots of stories on that subject let's just take a simple down-to-earth sort of story <clears throat> where uh we we'll we'd moved to the blue mountains this place in two hours out of sydney with my family I had seven kids at the time and uh one of them jasmine was about two or three somewhere around there and uh, we're in this house and she, she couldn't sleep in this room. She kept running into and said, Mommy, Daddy, there's a boy in there. He's sitting on the bed, you know. And we, we tried to uh, console her and this and that. Anyway, it went on for a little while, so we let her sleep with us and uh, there was something odd about that room, but I hadn't quite perceived what it was. And... My other older daughters would, were going to school and she, my little daughter, Jasmine, who was two or three, described the boy, you know, flannelette shirt, jeans, long hair, precisely. And uh, I think kids are still, you know, some kids are very sensitive as they're coming from that, you know, after being born, we're coming from that dimension, aren't we? And then it starts to fade because we, we don't want to be always, we want to be, don't want to be too sensitive because we want to enjoy this existence, right, this dense world which is full of fineness and subtlety however <clears throat> so my older my older daughters were in at school and they told their friends who we, we were new to the area about the boy and they knew the house we lived in and they said that's uh forgotten his name whatever it was he did he committed suicide you describe him perfectly in that house he committed suicide so uh, we went back we went into that room and we did our we, you know, salt. We put salt because salt is yang. So if heavy our spirit is yang. Yang is falling down, right? Yin is rising, lightness. Just as the baby is more yin than the placenta, placenta is blood, organ, you know, nourishment goes down, the lighter. And uh, salt is yang. It helps purify. We lit incense. We chanted and uh, we spoke. We spoke. We knew his name. I've forgotten what it is now because it was a long time ago. And we asked him to, it's time to, uh, to relax into where he needs to go now. And uh, it was hard work, though. He, wouldn't, he didn't want to go. You could feel it. I think when people have drugs, that's why I, I think we have, I mean, if we're dying and we're in pain, I think more things have it. <coughs> but if, um, if you can avoid it, it's better because, you know, your consciousness gets cloudy and you might see hallucination or not real things. So in his case, he died from, he was a drug user and it took a while to clear that room, but it did clear. You just reminded me of these sort of stories. Should I say one more and then? Finish? One more. There's so many, but uh, including, uh, including kind of exorcism type stuff, but we won't go there. <laughs> um, I got a phone call from a guy, uh, He's, he was, he's, he'd done the macrobiotic training. We had a, a macrobiotic, I do a macrobiotic diploma training. goes for a year. Some people say for a few years because we go deeper and deeper. But um, he, uh, his sister was uh, dying of breast cancer in the hospice. But I got the call in the middle of the night and uh, I said, uh, he said, look, she won't pass on. They've given her so much morphine and she's, She's thrashing around. She's seeing de delusions and demons and this and that. And my, all my brothers and sisters, they're all fighting with each other what to do. Should, 
one of the brothers wants to put a pillow over. <coughs> so, they, you know, so the, their mother was a wonderful person. They were from Liverpool, England. They were Irish and they were very, very uh, young. He was very young. He was a union delegate, got into fights. He was, you know, they were very young, the men in that family. And uh, this sister was the beloved of that family. And the mother was the most amazing woman. And once she'd gone, she was the glue that kept them all in harmony. Or, or as sometimes we could say, a more coarse example, the appendix that keeps the tone in the intestines. You know, keeps everything together. But, and uh, <clears throat> I said, and he said, what am I doing? You know, oh, it's crazy. There's fighting. There's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's just everywhere. And he's, I said, well, you've done this training. You're the, you're obviously the most, more conscious person there. You are, you know, you have, you, you should go. When people are near, near that stage, it's like birth, isn't it? We have people waiting for the baby, right? Spirit, the midwife. I said, usually someone very close is uh, reachable. So why don't I, you should go over to her and whisper, talk to her softly in her ear and say, I've forgotten her name as well. Jill, that's right. Jill, Jill, look, you know, in, within all the thrashing about and seeing things that, you know, phantasms, look, mum, mum is there, look. And he kept talking, she said, he, she, within all that, eventually she comes, yes, I do see her. I see her. There she is. And she started changing and smiling. And all the family that were all fighting and they looked. And they, they saw this calming, this different energy in the room and it affected everyone. He's, he's, um, he's over there whispering in her ear. Yeah, I do, sir. And then eventually they all witnessed her become incredibly peaceful and leaving the body. They saw something, nothing tangible. They all cried, they all hugged, it healed the family. There were all these divisions in the family. That passing healed, healed the family. I could go on, but I'd better stop because I'm running into other people's times, I think. But uh, and, uh, so thank you all for uh, listening. I, and I, is, think you could, sir? I feel like it's such an honor to have had you with us or to have you with us. I really appreciate your I stories, your it's spirit, to be here. your understanding. Yeah, it's it's really great. I, I really you. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.